John, he said, is this a sermon about marriage? Sorta, sorta, kinda. It's called Fighting the Boredom Bear. If you were to ask a marriage counselor what is one of the top reasons that marriages fail, they would tell you that boredom is kind of at the top of the, top of the list. Oh yes, marriage has failed because one partner cheats or one partner falls out of love, one partner leaves. But many times the reason for these actions is just boredom. A husband gets bored with his life, with his wife, with his job. He becomes restless. He does something reckless and selfish and destroys everything. A wife gets bored with the routine, bored with the man she's been married to for 20 years. And she finds something or someone else to take up her time. Of course, a wise counselor will not only deal with the cheating or the reckless behavior in trying to save the marriage, most counselors will also try to deal with the boredom that may have led to the actions that hurt the relationship. And during the counseling, the couple will often be asked to do things and think in ways that will try to put the excitement back into the marriage relationship and beat what I call the boredom bear that threatens to rip them apart. Well, this scenario is often played out in the church as well, and that's where the marriage analogy ends and the church reality begins. Christians who have been faithful to Christ for five, 10, 20 years or more begin feeling restless for one reason or another. They start thinking that maybe they're missing something. Maybe they've been doing this for so long that the motions are there, but the excitement is long gone from those first few years when their faith was on fire. Many Christians get bored with their Christian lives and they just quit because they're not getting out of it what they first got out of it those first few exciting years. Or they just get into a rut and they go through the motions, like being married to a person you don't love anymore. Been there too long to change or leave, so you just stay and you make the best of it. You gut it out, as they say. Well, I don't believe marriages should be like that because God created them to last a lifetime and His intent was not for us to be miserable for half of that lifetime. You know, I do a, another series, a kind of a seminar entitled In Love for Life because I believe that if God created marriage and for people to love one another, He also made it possible for us to love each other for an entire lifetime. And I don't believe that Christianity should be boring either, no matter how long you've been a Christian. And I know this because in the Bible I see that men and women who depended on the Lord grew sweeter and more joyful as they grew older, not bored, not restless. That's what this passage is about that Duane read for us. Psalm 92, just the last few verses after what I've just said, listen to what he's saying here once again. He says, the righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. Does that sound like boredom to you? He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. Does that sound like somebody who's tired? They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. Does that sound like something that's withered and old and tired and unproductive and dry? Is that what that passage says about the elderly who are faithful? They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is by rock and there is no unrighteousness in Him. I'm here to tell you that Christianity is not boring, not when one begins and not when one has been a Christian for 10 years or 50 years. Brothers and sisters, we are eternal. We are being prepared and fitted for life with God and Christ forever in heaven. Do you see boring there somewhere? How can this be boring? I'll tell you, I'll tell you what gets boring. What gets boring is sin. That's what gets boring. Illness, that gets boring. Ignorance, material things, these things become boring with repetition. 
Ask any sinner if his or her sin does not become boring with repetition, and the only way to recreate the excitement is to find new ways and greater ways to sin until they're exhausted and depressed. Ask any person who suffers from illness or suffers from injustice or limited opportunity because of prejudice or education or skill, their life is repetitious, their life is dull, their boredom is crushing. Speak to any person who truly has material wealth and they will tell you that after a while things, no matter how beautiful, no matter how much fun they may be, get boring. The rich are the most easily bored. But let's face it, because we are human, because we are weak, even though we are Christians, we sometimes get bored too. And I hate to say it, but even with the notion that we are God's children and being prepared for a heavenly dwelling, even in the face of that reality, it happens to us. Now for the moment we are on earth and because of this, it's not uncommon for the best of us, the most dedicated Christian, to be attacked by the boredom bear. And for those who are feeling the bear hug of boredom, here are a few things to help break free and perhaps find that excitement once again that we knew in Christ Jesus. If you want to beat the boredom bear, number one, begin with serious prayer and Bible study. Keyword, serious. Nothing sparks spiritual life more than fervent prayer. Nothing revives a tired faith more than a return to active prayer life. You know, when couples come from counseling, uh, they review their lifestyle and their reasons why their relationship isn't working anymore. And one of the primary reasons that I've found is that there is a lack of meaningful communication. This is usually the basic reason why our relationship with God also goes flat. We don't communicate in a meaningful way with Him and we don't allow Him to communicate in a meaningful way with us. We, 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 we push Him away. Hearing someone else lead a prayer at worship service does not substitute for a personal prayer life. Saying thank you before meals does not do much for total communication between yourself and God. Just as any serious and satisfying communication between two people requires the sharing of dreams and fears, words of love and words of passion, acknowledgement of weakness and pain, the talk between ourselves and God must also go beyond simple thanks for favors, must go beyond constant asking for help, constant asking for healing. I hear the prayer cards week after week after week after week and the ones that say thank you are one versus 20 that ask for help and so on and so forth. We have to begin revealing our true selves. We have to begin revealing our deepest desires and fears and questions and dreams to the one who really does understand us. The Psalms are wonderful models for prayer because in them the authors poured their hearts out before God. Their anger, their hurt, their desires, their victory, their joys, their sorrows, even their meanness. Everything was on display before God. They spoke to God about every area of their lives, about every thought that crossed their minds, good and bad, even about things they didn't understand and argued with Him about. Seems to me that's a real relationship. You know, we're bored because we don't explore our hearts and minds before God in prayer, and we don't explore His heart and His mind through Bible study and reading. It's amazing how prayer and Bible reading and study work together to form a spiritual dialogue between ourselves and God. We talk to Him in prayer, He answers through His word as we read it, as we study it. You know, for years I prayed for God to help me in my ministry and give me confidence and give me joy in my work. But I'll tell you, it was only when I, I became a daily Bible reader that God answered that prayer and that's an easy trap for ministers to fall into because ministers say, well, I'm working with the Bible all the time. I don't need a quiet time. 
I don't need a, a time when I'm at home where I'm just quiet, where I turn off the TV, the radio, my phone, my Twitter, whatever. I turn all that off and I just, I just read the Bible, not, not to find a lesson or something, just to read it. And just to talk to God about the day. I don't need that, I'm a minister. I don't, who needs that? And you know what, I needed that. It was, only began, it was only when I began to develop that personal habit that my ministry really began to grow. In regular Bible reading, I discovered all the ideas and outlines for sermons that I used to worry over in the beginning of my ministry when I was not one of these regular Bible readers and daily Bible readers. God's answer was there waiting for me. I just didn't communicate properly by allowing Him to speak to me in this way. And it's the same with all of us. We don't talk to God. We don't allow Him to talk to us. And we feel spiritually dry and bored. Well, no wonder. So the first way to refresh our spirit is to allow our spirit to speak to the Lord and drink in His spirit by reading the word. Amen? Thank you. Thank you. Man, there's, a, there's a boy after my own heart right there. Way to go, Daxon, whoever you are. You know, it looks good for the next generation. This generation, I'm not so sure, but the next group coming up. You want to beat the boredom bear? Here it is. Number two, go beyond the minimum. Go beyond the minimum. So many relationships go flat because the partners are just going through the motions. No more little love notes in your lunch. All they talk about is money or the kids. She doesn't fix herself up like she used to and he doesn't tell her all the sweet things he liked about her when they were first married. Everybody's just phoning it in and that gets dull. Well, our spiritual life gets that way at times because all we do is the minimum. Minimum church attendance. Minimum. Minimum moral behavior. I drink, but I don't get drunk. I swear, but I don't use the Lord's name. I'm sexually active, but I don't really go all the way. I'm a Christian, but not so much that anyone would actually notice. Minimum service to the Lord. I'll do stuff for the church so long as it doesn't seriously interfere with my earning power or my hobbies. Minimum. It's the old story. You get out of something what you put into something. If minimum is what you put in, then minimum is what you're going to get out. Christianity is not like gambling. Gambling is where you put in just a little bit with the chance of hitting the jackpot. That's gambling. Minimum, you know, and if you translate that to your spiritual life, minimum spiritual effort in order to hit the jackpot of wisdom and great faith and, and high moral standards, you know? That's, that's spiritual gambling. With Christianity, the spiritual life you experience is in direct proportion to the degree of effort that you invest. If you're bored with God and Christianity, chances are God is bored with you and your minimum effort. You ever think about that? If you want some spiritual excitement, try doing something exciting for a change. Go beyond your usual giving and give sacrificially. Go ahead, try. Go beyond your usual attendance and actually be here all the time and bring somebody for a change. Go beyond your usual minimum and go overboard for Christ in the way you act, the way you think, the way you serve, the way you pray, the way you forgive, the way you study. If you want excitement, go out on a limb for the Lord. Let Him lead you for a change. Try walking by faith. These are the type of things that people like Noah and David and Mary and Paul did and their lives were never dull. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in Philippians 4 verse 13. We are a people who have been called to do all things, not just the minimum. If our spiritual lives are dull, it's not because God is dull. It's not because His kingdom is dull. It's not because His word is dull. It's usually because we've allowed ourselves to become dull by lowering the spiritual bar to the absolute minimum. That's why we're bored. 
Would you like to go to the Olympics? And would you like to wa watch world-class athletes, let's say in track and field, uh, the jumping competition, the champion jumps two feet? Or perhaps the high jump, he jumps six inches? Would that be the Olympics? Would that be exciting? Or does you know, the mile in three hours and 22 minutes? That's my time, but that's another, that's another issue. You know what I'm saying? We're excited because we see elite athletes performing at a high level. Well, what about us? Aren't we elite Christians? Can't we perform at elite levels? Why must we always aim for the lowest? Want to beat the boredom bear number three? Focused on lost souls not just your soul. You know, when couples are close to divorce and come to me for help and I begin to question them about what they are doing and thinking, much of the time I find that their attention has been focused exclusively on themselves. It's a trap. Things don't go well in a relationship so we blame ourselves or we withdraw into ourselves. Or we get used to each other and neglect one another in favor of doing and thinking more about ourselves and our needs. In other words, I got to take care of me. And once we start thinking in that way, I got to take care of me, you can say goodbye to the relationship. Our spiritual lives suffer in the same way when we, pray, when we pay more attention to our feelings, our spiritual needs, our soul's comfort instead of the needs of others who have not yet found salvation for their souls. It is no coincidence that new Christians are not only the most interested in sharing their faith with others, they're also the most enthusiastic spiritually. They're not simply excited about Christ because they're new converts, they're feeding that excitement by sharing the gospel with other people. Soul winning is exciting. No matter how you go about it, it's exciting. If you don't believe me, ask the people in this congregation who taught or who helped the people who were baptized last year. 16 people were baptized in this congregation. Ask the people who led those people to Christ if their religion and if their faith is boring. Ask the people who work with Robert George when they receive word that one of their students has accepted Christ. Ask them if they're bored. Ask those who visit the sick. Ask those who serve communion to shut-ins. Ask those who offer hospitality. Ask those who greet guests, distribute information, work in the youth, organize church events. Ask them if they are bored with Christ. Go ahead. Ask them how they feel when they participate in the saving of someone's soul. They feel great. They feel excited. They feel joyful and thankful and humbled. And in one word, they feel power. The power of God working through their lives. You know, a lot of times we want to feel that way simply by sitting in the pew and having the word spoken to us word week after week. That's not how you feel the power of God's life in you. But the word tells us and everybody's experience from Pentecost until this day has been that excitement comes from preaching the word and sharing the gospel and leading others to Christ, not just passive listening to lessons about these things. Christianity is not like sports where you can get excited by watching. In Christianity you only get excited by actually playing the game. So if your spiritual life is dull, if your Christianity is being eaten up by the boredom bear, remember the way to change. Remember the things we talked about this morning. First of all, make serious prayer and Bible reading a priority over TV, over busy work, over telling everybody what you're doing from minute to minute online. Now I didn't say we can't watch TV, we can't take care of our business. I said make prayer and Bible study a priority, something you will do first before TV. Or if you only have time for one thing, make it the thing that you do instead of the other. You want to beat the boredom bear? Start pushing yourself spiritually. Begin making steps to reach higher goals morally and spiritually. 
Let Jesus Christ become the Lord of your work, the Lord of your sports, the Lord of your marriage, and watch what happens. And then finally, try to win a soul for Christ. Use whatever method you can, but make a conscious effort to bring someone to the point where they will become a Christian. You'll find out that whatever they choose to do, you will feel more alive spiritually than you ever have before. You know, speaking of excitement, nothing is more exciting, believe it or not, than the anticipation that the invitation brings. It should be the most exciting thing. I mean, it's the moment when people make decisions about change. It's the moment when people make decisions about new directions and the rest of us are witness either of the power of God's word at work or the power of sin resisting. And we are witnesses to see which one of those is victor. Please remember to pray to God during this moment that souls will be saved and not just look for car keys and how much time is left in the service. It's part of the service. The angels will rejoice and the church will be excited and our spirits will be lifted if even one sinner comes to Christ today, if one prodigal comes home. If the Lord is calling you now, please do not hesitate to come as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. <laughs>